I just give it a few more seconds. Still going up there. Cool, so we'll get started now. Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, my name's Nicola and I'm going to be your host for this evening. So I just want to say thank you to everyone for taking their time to join us this evening for this seminar that's been very kindly supported by SuperValue. So this seminar is part of an As I Am SuperValue webinar series that we've been running in partnership with SuperValue uh, throughout 2021. So the topic tonight is uh, autism and PDA. So I will very quickly just introduce you to our speakers tonight. So tonight we have two speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Niall Kenny. So Niall is Assistant Professor at the School of Inclusion and Special Education in DCU. And our second speaker is Margaret Lyons. So Margaret is our parent guest speaker tonight who will be sharing her own personal experiences as a mother of a child with PDA. So I'll just very quickly be giving you a brief overview. So first we'll hear from Niall for about 40 minutes and then Margaret will speak for about 20 minutes. And then we'll be taking some questions at the end for around 15 to 20 minutes, just depending on how much time we have left. So just to very quickly note a few things before we get started. Um, if you do look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A box. So if you do have a question uh, throughout the presentation, just feel free to pop your question into the box and we'll try our very best to answer at the end. So you'll notice as well that we do have subtitles turned on for the seminar. So if you do want to turn them off, there is an option next to the chat box. Um, it's a box that says live transcript and in there you can select mute subtitle. So I will now pass you over to our first speaker of the evening, Niall. Uh, he'll be starting. So thanks again, Niall, for joining us this evening and feel free to start whenever you feel ready. Thanks very much, Nicola. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, as Nicola said, my name is Neil and um, I'm, uh, well, my job basically is that I work as part of the School of Inclusive and Special Education on programs for practicing teachers who work in special classes, special schools and in mainstream SET roles supporting autistic pupils at primary, post-primary and in special schools. So for the most part, um, what I do is I work with teachers. Um, and um, my background though is in psychology. So um, I kind of, I'm a bit of a slashy. So I'll bring kind of things from kind of a, a, that kind of diverse perspective. And um, so what I hope to talk to you all about this evening is, as the title said, talk about autism in a general sense, and then focus in on the construct that some know as pathological demand avoidance. Um, not the catchiest um, or friendliest sounding term, it has to be said, but um, we'll use it because that's what's most commonly used. And um, so um, I'll just, I put together some slides, so I'll just put those up on the screen. Um, is that working, Nicola? Yeah. Sorry, yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> no, no problem at all. Um, so, uh, part of what I want what I want to talk to you about this evening really is talking in general um, about autism and to give some information with regard to PDA um, both internationally and then in an Irish context. So the emphasis really on this is we'll be talking about diversity within the autism spectrum and the way that butts up against how we provide services in Ireland, whether it's education or health um, or whatever you're having. Um, so it's very categorical in Ireland and that has knock on impacts that are very relevant to the topic of tonight's conversation. Um, and I'll then move on to drawing on a research study and a conference that myself and my colleagues um, Dr. Alison Doyle of Sarah's Education and uh, Dr. Sinead McNally had a um, uh, little over a year ago in DCU, which was uh, focused on uh, PDA in an Irish context and was done in collaboration with parents, practitioners, whether they be teachers, uh, psychologists, speech and language therapists, um, uh, or occupational therapists and members of the autistic community as well in developing evidence-informed guidelines. So these materials are all freely available and I would encourage you to go have a look at them um, because they're really focused on translating what the, the literature says and what theory says into what 
might be possible to um, as a solution to a particular issue you're facing or as a way of uh, approaching and um, supporting uh, a, a young person who is showing with a demand avoidance profile. Um, so I hope that's okay with uh, what people are looking for. Um, but I'll have questions at the end and please feel free to ask me if there's anything that I haven't addressed that you'd like me to address. Very free, I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have. So I, I'm gonna talk generally um, about autism to start off with. Um, now I'm sure you're all very aware and very familiar with you know, the presentation um, of autism. Um, now I, it's, I suppose there's been a big movement um, in recent decades to standardize as much as is possible what the features of um, uh, autism may be and how autistic individuals may present. Um, and since the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual um, in 2013, it's been, uh, I suppose, shrunk down from um, a more broader uh, past um, uh, presentation descriptions to being circled around two uh, dyads of differences one being deficits in social communication, social interaction, and that these would be present across contexts and settings. Um, and the other presentation would be uh, described as, you know, uh, characterized by restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior, strong preferred interests or focuses, and a preference in that, uh, it, it, towards that kind of monotropic focus. Um, now, obviously these, that's a simplified version, um, but this, uh, developmental difference is present from birth and uh, progresses across the whole lifespan trajectory. Um, but as you see, the little star down the end says there are 12 combinations and seven criteria and two different core features. So, you know, it's a bit more complicated than that. And autism in an Irish context, I suppose, is, uh, you know, something that the, the lay population are very, very familiar with simply because it's something that is being changing in such a short period of time. The incidence really has gone up massively uh, in recorded statistics in recent years, uh, up to one in 65 from recent HSE um, uh, publications. Um, and really, if you look at the emphasis within the international framework, it's looking to try and facilitate uh, standardized and valid diagnostic uh, criteria so that people, uh, clinicians feel very confident in their diagnosis. And it gives the impression of kind of standardized presentations and uh, a kind of autism specific supports, especially with the teachers who really um, would be the people I would be working with for the most part, you know, you hear quite a lot about autism specific approaches or techniques um, as if these will be effective for everybody if they're autistic. Um, and if you can see in the, 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 the statistics in front of you there, this has led to a deeply categorical system. Um, now, we do, do have a tendency this way. The HSC is very much set out in this format as well. But in, in the Irish education system, this is played out in speed. Um, the number of people uh, who received SNA support in mainstream schools went up 83% um, in five years in the early part of this decade. And the funding has gone up exponentially towards not just autism specific education, but special education. Um, and it's gone up fast and it now comprises a fifth of overall budget spending, um, which is enormous. Um, but if you look at it, I suppose 20% of individuals in the uh, pupils in schools at primary and post primary have some form of diagnosed special educational need or difference. Um, the approach of choice up to very, very recently has been the provision of special classes where possible within mainstream school settings. So you seem to have this kind of explosion of special classes specifically in the area of um, meeting the needs of autistic students. So in 2014, 2015, there was 530 of these and 95 early intervention classes. And four or five years later that had gone up it had doubled practically um and then early intervention to over a thousand and there was over a hundred early intervention classes so basically they're opening special classes as fast as they can put bricks on top of each other with some differences in geographic 
um, prevalence of special classes, I think most of you would be aware of, especially in some areas of the um, built up cities. So the issue with this kind of universalist approach is that if you look at uh, these, I just cut out of the internet. So um, a lot of these are quite out of date, but that's my point. Um, a lot of this is based around the diagnostic categories within the DSM, but obviously we're on DSM-5. Um, so those descriptions that guide clinical um, diagnosis, they've changed massively in recent years, even down to, um, that's an old image, the umbrella with the, uh, the uh, jigsaw pieces. Um, and then, for example, conditions within there, for example, like Asperger's syndrome, which no longer are uh, clinically available uh, as a diagnosis you can receive, or topics on the bottom uh, image there with severe to high functioning autism, which are uh, in the process of, I suppose, not being used to the same degree anymore. So we need to keep in mind that autism uh, and the diagnosis of autism, um, uh, the, the level of standardization of that is to some degree a social construct. Not that autism is not a thing, it doesn't exist. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is understandings of it evolve over time, as does approaches to what it looks like and how we should support individuals uh, that are autistic. Um, so this is a piece of art created by um, an autistic man named Stuart Nielsen. Um, he, uh, um, his art is in the Biennale um, in Venice this year, which is very, very um, uh, a significant achievement. But what he's done is this is called Autism O'Clock, and it it's, creates wordles based around the different diagnosed, diagnostic manuals over the years. So you can see some of the, if we'll go to the, up to the top to 1952, and you can see the type of words that were used then, and they bear no resemblance to the current understanding of autism. And you could pick any number of those iterations of the diagnosis over time, and you will see significant changes over time. So why am I making this point? The point I'm making is that there is a drive towards trying to standardize understandings of autism, uh, autistic people, how autistic people may present themselves when you meet them, um, what autistic, autistic individuals, I suppose, need for support in schools. And of course, the reality of that is that's a massive simplification um, and that autistic individuals are every bit um, as individual as any other category we can think of. And there's a massive degree of diversity within the autism spectrum. And this is further complicated to a degree by the fact that neurodevelopmental conditions have wide degrees of crossover. So what do I mean by that is that so uh, many individuals that are autistic from diagnosis will also have co-occurring other diagnostic conditions. So uh, really, really um, common examples of this is high levels of anxiety, ADHD, or other sensory related specific learning differences such as dyspraxia or dyslexia. It's extremely common. And indeed, as the uh, young person becomes a teenager, the number of co-occurring conditions can multiply. So you're not dealing with a simple standardized profile, but rather you're dealing with an individual who may need supports in a number of different ways. Sorry, I think I've jumped ahead of my slides there, but basically the numbers are very high. 70% of individuals that have an autistic diagnosis have another diagnosis um, and 41% of two or more. Um, the most common are ADHD, as I mentioned, and anxiety. And this appears, for example, with ang anxiety appears to co-occur at high levels across the lifespan. So it's not something that the person um, moves beyond in many cases. So another important condition or consideration, sorry, I'm going to reference Pelicano et al, who talked about uh, the autistic community's priorities for research. And really these focused around increasing understanding of autistic perspectives, autistic experiences, um, as opposed to clinical medical model um, understandings and that the focus of research and service provision should have um, an emphasis on supporting 
the person towards succeeding in life. So educational attainment, you know, uh, achieving an accurate um, diagnosis and post-diagnostic support and that the services that would be made available would be appropriate um, and support the person in, for example, after school um, transitioning into education um, or employment. So these are very reasonable um, aims, but really I, I think they emphasize the diversity that exists in autism, despite many understandings of uh, how autistic individuals and what their preferences or needs may be. Um, so this is relevant, and I spent such a time talking about it because it's particularly important when we're talking about what is described as pathological demand avoidance. So the first thing about this is that it's a complicated. Um, there remains a disagreement or controversy with regard to what PDA is or is not. Um, so some individuals, um, such as the PDA Society and Autistic Society in the UK, um, and much of the research literature would have to say, would, it would report pathological demand avoidance co-occurring with autism most often. However, there is examples in the literature that, of individuals who do not meet the autistic criteria um, for a diagnosis of autism, but do display um, criteria of pathological demand avoidance. Um, but I think this could be said for most other features of the autism presentation. Um, they occur outside of autism. But for example, researchers such as Green or Woods do uh, emphasize that they don't see it as um, an autism specific profile. So just keep that in mind. Um, and this really goes back to the diagram I showed you earlier about neurodevelopmental differences. Um, and a report such as the uh, Embracing Complexity Commission report um, in the UK really emphasized the crossover between differences in presentation and neurodevelopmental differences. So within this, PDA fits. Um, and really this draws on, um, this is an old diagram, so it does talk about some um, aspects of, of wordings or labels that are, are out of date, to be honest, but it really emphasized the crossover between um, what were called at the time, because this comes from the early 2000s, pervasive developmental disorders. These were done away with um, in, in, in the way they're described here in the latest iteration of the DSM. But it talked about crossover between autism, pathological demand avoidance, and other uh, pervasive developmental disorders, and how they're linked both with regard to genetic markers and the fact that uh, autism is genetically influenced research suggests now how isn't clear um, but it is also deeply influenced by the environment um, and and it, these presentations differ from each other but are also linked um, so the research literature suggests there's a group of autistic individuals who differ in their experience of the world around them and others and their needs um, in order to access support. So um, for these individuals, conventional, uh, usually highly recommended, highly structured approaches to supporting access to education, for example. So very common educational advice is to use structured teaching, um, visual schedules, um, structured uh, motivation systems, um, um, for example. These are shown not to be effective and in fact counterproductive for many of the young people um, and adults in this, uh, who meet this profile. Adults with PDA particularly report, you know, um, challenges in emotional regulation and managing their emotions um, and, um, and managing social skills and social relationships, but have more uh, sophisticated uh, communication repertoires uh, than other presentations within the autism system, uh, autism spectrum, excuse me. Um, so, they share some of the, you know, for example, uh, social interaction um, and focus and repetitive or preferred interests, but differ with regard to um, communication skills and with regard to um, how they respond to structured environments and demands. Um, now, the 
the presentation can seem a little bit vague. Uh, we'll address that in a minute when we talk about our own research, which looked to try and find how this was presenting in an Irish context and pro provided deeper, I suppose, fleshing out of the um, descriptions. So. PDA is often described as well as an individual who may seem to have quite sophisticated social uh, communication skills, sorry, and ability to express things, however, may show a lack of understanding with regard to the impact of their behaviours on others or the consequences of their behaviours um, as they follow on, demonstrating a different but similar pattern of um, challenges understanding social interactions and social um, relationships. Um, resists and avoids what are described as the ordinary demands of life. Now, I know others would suggest that um, this is, I suppose, it's an expression of agency and should the person not be able to make um, decisions for themselves with regard to what they prefer or don't prefer, but um, autistic self, uh, sorry, uh, autistic self-advocates who um, present with PDA or identify with PDA would suggest that the, these kind of um, responses to demand and avoidance of demand often feel not under their own control or reflexive um, and something that they struggle to manage or control. Um, use of social strategies are also common. To, uh, to affect avoidance. So things like distracting, giving excuses, changing the subject, um, and other types of ways of avoiding demands, which can be quite communication-wise, socially sophisticated, um, and therefore may present um, one picture which would not give a good understanding of uh, the, the person themselves. Um, so another key feature of PDA is the experience of heightened anxiety and concern with predictability and a lack of control or a lack of ability to predict what will happen. So hence control coming into things. Anxiety is a significant issue and that can't be emphasized enough. Um, in the uh, adults who would identify with PDA or have a diagnosis of PDA would ha describe, you know, significant mood um, um, swings and experience of impulsivity and a lack of control over the moods or an experience of that. Um, individuals who present with PDA would um, also describe being comfortable in role play and pretense, and in fact, more comfortable in that kind of highly controlled and structured, whereby the person is, you know, has a script for the a social interaction, is more comfortable playing that out rather than, I suppose, uh, the engaging and sharing a world with the individual they're there with, because of course that's not under control, um, and displays obsessive behavior that is often focused on the other people and controlling the other individual. Um, so these would also characterize ways of managing high levels of anxiety, um, just to go back to that topic again. Now, so I'm just going to move over now just to talk about the study that myself, uh, Dr. Doyle and Dr. McNally conducted recently. Um, this looked at the um, mapping of pathological demand avoidance in Ireland and really sought, because there was no data at all with regard to experiences in Ireland, and sought to explore this with reference um, to the experience of parents, clinicians and teachers, um, and individuals who identified with PDA themselves and bring the whole thing together. This report is freely available. Um, uh, um, it was supported by the Irish Research Council uh, and it was conducted in collaboration with PRISM DLR, um, who can be found at that link down the bottom there. And the uh, report and the um, guidelines that were produced following from this um, are freely available there as well. So I'd encourage you to have a look. And um, what I intend talking about here is talking about uh, some of the results of that that will flesh out some of what I talked about already and then talking about the guidelines that came from that. So um, 
there we go. So the results that we got from this really, I suppose, provided a snapshot in a little bit more detail of the description I described um, in the previous slides. So um, this maybe isn't presented in an ideal sense, but some of the issues that were identified across the, co uh, the participant cohorts would be, ex to be would be similar to what was talked about before. So, um, eighty one percent identified sensory issues as characterizing the experience of PDA or the presentation of PDA. Um, severe anxiety, which is actually down near the bottom, and uh, maybe not an ideal placement of it, was also significantly present. As was the need to feel in control. Up at, these are all up around 80% of participants. It's extremely high. So these uh, you know, would be similar to the experience of many individuals where autistic individuals, but the extent of it may be different. Um, you might also so, uh, note ways in which this is playing out. So if you're looking at uh, difficulties with attending school, difficulties with daily routines, morning time and bedtime, you know, up over, uh, you know, 50% and up near 70%. Also a lack of friends and difficulty maintaining or repairing re relationships with others. So you can see the kind of, now, some of these issues, uh, as you're aware, um, such as sleep problems, which is also prevalent there, um, are also quite common, unfortunately, um, uh, in individuals, autistic individuals who don't present with a demand avoidant profile. But I suppose it's, again, the extent and the way in which it translates into daily experience is the issue here. Um, now, if you look at adults with PDA, you're seeing, uh, who identify with PDA, you're seeing a similar profile, so it doesn't change much. Um, high levels, possibly the high levels are, are the levels in internal experiences and mood experiences are more of an issue for adults, which is common with regard to internalization of life experience in general um, um, in people. So you're seeing high levels of anxiety, low self-esteem, heightened levels of depression, and sensory issues is, is there as well with mood swings and need for control. So you know, you're seeing quite a, um, a challenging profile experienced by both young people and adults. So these kind of uh, issues persist over the lifespan. Um, now, this has translates into impacts in important things like accessing services. So you remember at the start, I talked quite a lot about the um, highly standardized and categorical systems we use in Ireland to support vulnerable individuals in our society. So we base a lot of services around diagnostic categories. So where you have complex profiles, such as, for example, autistic individuals with a demand of Odin profile, or even rarer, individuals who don't meet the autistic profile, but display demand avoidant um, features, they can fall between services and can struggle significantly with accessing a diagnosis. So a lot of the parents we talked about spoke, for example, long-term um, engagement but prior with services prior to being able to access a diagnosis. Some of them had been undergoing parent training for years because it was a default fallback where categories weren't being, I suppose, the person being assessed wasn't falling into particular categories. And you see some of the accounts um, there of, for example, if there's a disability service who um, were dealing with the young person and their family because of the heightened level of autistic presentations, um, the uh, uh, skill set within the disability services, some of our, our participants were suggesting, wasn't ideal for supporting the uh, accurate diagnosis, or if it was an autistic service because of the heightened level of mood, um, dis, uh, d dysregulation or challenges that are being sent across to the CAMS team who lack the services for um, uh, supporting a, an accurate autism diagnosis. You're getting the picture. So a lot of individuals were not accessing services. Some of them were being um, not accessing services for a long, long period of time, which is 
the least ideal situation. And you're also seeing ways in which the profile of the young person was impacting their engagement with services. So, um, you know, you've seen a high, that level need for the degree to which the young person needed um, to experience a sense of control impacted and was correlated with access to school. So heightened level of a need for control was correlated with uh, um, absences from school, um, because obviously schools are chaotic, um, loud and unpredictable environments that are often characterized by demands um, from external factors, such as teachers, for example. Um, and I suppose butted up to this really was the issue with a lack of available information. So this graph gives an idea of where people were getting their information from. So um, you'll note none is a high scorer there. So they had no access to services at all. And then um, uh, I suppose we call them international sources such as Google and the PDA Society, which is a UK based organization, which is a range of resources, which I suggest you should access. Um, these were by far the heightened, the highest examples of places people got the services from and other small charities, for example, PRISM, which is a small charity that we partner with and do great work, but they're a small charity located in Dunleary, so it doesn't suit everybody. Um, so there's a lack of understanding and awareness and uh, participants suggested that one of the biggest barriers to access service was um, a lack of engagement with what the PDA profile means whether or not you agree with it being a thing or it being associated with autism, but its implications. So the data suggests there are concrete, real life implications for how the young person is presenting. So that is concrete and that needs to be taken seriously as we should do for how any human we meet presents and asks for what they need. Um, also challenges with managing demand avoidance and avoidance of tasks um and um lack of engagement with school so there was a lack of understanding of the implications for this um and oftentimes parents reported or adults reported that demand in response to trying to avoid demand the demands were increased and people became more aggressive less tolerant etc and which played into a lack of engagement with school on the part of young people particularly teenagers or a lack of engagement with diagnosed diagnostic services uh, uh, or in adult services with leaving the house. Um, so leaving the house is a major issue as you would have seen from the previous graph um, for the adult participants in the study. So what's really important to here is to understand that individual relationship-based perspectives are what's needed. Know the person you're working with, listen to them and adapt. There's no such thing as autism specific approaches that work for all autistic people. It doesn't pan out. So some of the parents talked about, just to give you the, some of the, the data that fell from the qualitative side of it, after we're talking about the quantitative side of the study. Um, so a parent talking about their child, no access to education, no access to services, no supports, watching the preventable decline of my child in constant anger, instances of meltdown, violence, negativity, inappropriate behavior, depression and anxiety, not having a life, feeling helpless. So obviously this is the um, predictable outcome of an unsupported young person and their family, because obviously all young person uh, young people we're talking about exist within a family system and family supports is the model we should be using. I know that parent talked about my son is about to go to secondary school and I'm going to give it my absolute best shot, but I'd be fairly confident it's not going to work. Um, and, you know, people will say, what's your plan? Um, do you have one, etc." And the feeling of helplessness and the ongoing predictability of failure and di disengagement from services. Um, and looking at the outcomes of disengages from services for young people, if we use quality of life measures for the um, impact of life experience for all adults in Ireland, they are education, income, employment, um, and these kind of factors. So if you don't access school or services 
or stay at home all the time from the early teenage years, your quality of life, as is measured across all of us in Ireland, will be very poor, according to the metrics. So staying in school or engaging with services is vital across the rest of the person's life. So um, as this person says, the most important thing um, of all when dealing with PDA is to provide a safe, secure environment that is completely independent. Independence is not just an abnormal need, it's also our greatest strength. We need passive support. Active support is just pushing us into our limits and crippling us and, in dis and disengagement. So it's uh, um, the reverse of what you would expect. Uh, another individual adult um, said, ideally nobody must ever be allowed to live a life like mine again on any excuse. It's been totally unnecessary kind of hell. Um, somehow services need to be geared to accept that vulnerability and capability are not mutually exclusive. Allowance must be made for the fact that trust does not come naturally to autistics um, and uh, PDA. Sometimes isolation is a much healthier choice, particularly for autistics and PDA. Some PDA is reactive and totally justified. Um, so the person would be logically expected to recede and avoid a situation that's unpleasant, punishing, rejecting um, and painful. That's just logically what a person would do. Um, so it's really important we get this right. So what we looked to do was work with uh, using the Delphi method as much as possible um, with regard to parents, professionals, clinicians, um, organizations such as NEPS and the NCSE where possible, and as I am, who participated as well, much appreciated, um, and members of the autistic community and teachers. I'm sure I'm forgetting some, but to develop resources to support knowledge and what to do. As I said, these are freely available. So I'm just gonna talk around them because I won't have time, but I would encourage you to access them yourself in whatever capacity you are. So there's advice from for parents, from parents. Um, there's advice with regard to clinicians um, and how to approach a diagnosis and how to address the report teachers at primary and post-primary, adult services support and higher education support, et cetera, in each category with an idea of as easy a translation as is possible. So with regard to the advice for parents, some of the main points that would be brought up was that, um, you know, with regard to the lack of clarity around whether how PDA fits within the medical model diagnostic system. I'm not saying this is not important. It is, for God's sake, it's how our whole service provision is, is engineered in the state. But preparing for this is important. Obviously, um, if the person meets a diagnosis of autism as a threshold, an additional report should not be required. Rather, it would be within the advice or um, guidance within the report whereby a demand avoidant profile is specified. It's not any different. It's just a different presentation per se. Obviously, if the person doesn't meet the criteria for autism, that's a different situation altogether. The majority of this literature uh, suggests of individuals with PDA also present the meeting the criteria for autism. Um, it's also not caused, PDA is not caused by parenting styles or bad parenting. That is an unbelievably common and unbelievably outdated. Um, now, obviously families need support, absolutely, but there's a balance here with regard to, it's not going to make demand avoidance go away, obviously. It, this is a lifelong presentation. Um, you know, providing support, is essential uh, and approaches to interacting and supporting the young person, sort of passive support, a non, um, uh, is sort of uh, using a non-specific language with regard to uh, telling the young person what they have to do, or naming them or whatever, rather passive suggestions uh, and encouragement as opposed to directions. And then ways of accessing parental support and the need to advocate for their child, which was a common um, finding within the, within the results, having to advocate to uh, principals and teachers to make them aware, advocate to clin clinicians within the diagnostic process. Well, have you thought about this? 
Um, and the reality is, as the young person gets older, the parents need to acquire the skills. That I'm just describing, I'm not saying this is okay, but this is still reality, and I parent myself. Um, how to access supports, how to select the correct service, how to prepare for post-school environment. These kind of things, parents are deeply involved in that, and that needs support. Those are some of the things there, but you can read the freely available resources yourself with regard to the uh, developed clinicians um, providing a diagnosis or attempting to. Um, it's a very challenging environment and it's about supporting um, the preparing before the assessment. So, you know, for example, uh, Dr. Doyle talked about writing to the individuals, identifying who they are, not giving, giving directive statements, um, outlining what will and what may happen um, and using passive language, supportive approaches to assessment. So being flexible, meeting the person where they are, following and allowing the person lead within it rather than uh, being overly inflexible and didactic, i.e. demanding, um, and provision of some wording that may be useful with regard to description of how to support an autistic individual with a demand avoidant profile, and then evidence-informed um, guidance and some uh, uh, CBD or PATH uh, framework, for example, are some examples of ways to uh, support the individual that have shown some success or to support planning uh, in collaboration with parents into the future. So these are the type of considerations that are there. Um, now, primary and post-primary schools, they obviously are very different. The advice is quite different, but there's some things that go through it um, that I'll synopsize because I'm running out of time. Relationships are the building block. Build a relationship, get to know the young person, get to know the important people in their lives. If a bridging person who the young person trusts is available, that this person should be part of the planning and support the transition into school or manage repairs with regard to absences from school. Look at the school environment. Remember the presentation of sensory overload and challenges and high levels of anxiety. Um, and as I am, among others, have sensory assessment tools that would allow an audit of the environment. The SESS have also an excellent tool. Work with the individual, not against them. An overly didactic approach has been shown to be ineffective and be aware and plan strategically for how you communicate with the individual such that it's not directive, labeling, naming them and what they should do, um, among other things. Um, I think I'm out of time. Um, so I'm just going to say these are freely available. Um, I would encourage you to um, go have a look anyway, um, and I'd be happy to answer questions here. Um, or if people want to contact me um, at a later date. So um, thank you very much. And I'll talk to you all um, a little bit later. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Neil, for that no very problem. informative presentation. And um, I do see some questions coming into the questions and answers box. So we'll do our very best to answer those questions just at the end of the seminar. Uh, so I'm now going to pass you guys on to Margaret. So she'll be sharing some of her personal experiences just as a parent of a child uh, with PDA. So you can begin whenever you feel ready, Margaret. Yeah, Grant. Uh, I just want to say thank you for having me, um, Nicola, and as I am. And um, just I won't fit everything in. It's a very, very big, uh, <laughs> complex thing to talk about. So I'll, I'm going to try and hit as many as I can in, in our story. Um, so thank you again. Um, I am a mommy to two autistic boys. I have Noah, who is seven, and I have Elliot, who is three. Uh, Noah is autistic. Um, he has PDA, uh, sensory processing disorder, dyspraxia, and um, hypermobility. So he's a few things going on. Um, he, when he was a baby, he was a fantastic baby. He slept, he ate. I found myself lying to other men. <laughs> I mean, so I was up all night, uh, you know, because he because he wouldn't sleep. And, and we were blessed. We knew no different. It was the first baby. As time went on, we realized that he may be on the spectrum um, and we applied to the HSE. Uh, things changed for us then as, as we got him diagnosed privately at two and a half um, so that we were able to help him um, like everybody and get some services that we needed. Um, Noah was a regressor. So he did things and they disappeared. Um, he spoke and it disappeared and this is the way he kind of went on up till about two-ish. Um, 
one of the things that did disappear was language and it disappeared for a little while and it came back, it disappeared. But then it came back and it came back very, very strong at around three, three and a half. And um, his language was unbelievable. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, he, he could he could talk about everything and anything and, and talk to people and adults in particular. He really had a thing for adults. Um, but as we soon learned, we realized that his understanding actually wasn't 100% um, there. He, at three, he started in a mainstream in a Mon Montessori um, due to not being able to access any preschools. Um, and we started to notice that things were a little different. Um, I we couldn't explain it at the time, but he was kind of, you know, he he was just a different child as he was going out the door to Montessori and when he got there. Um, and one day I was called and I was told um, that he was manipulative. And by God, did that hit me. It hit me like a ton of bricks. I couldn't believe that he was being told that he was manipulative. How could a three-year-old be manipulative? And obviously being a mommy, I fought back and I said, don't be so silly, he's autistic and he's a little person. That's, that's a crazy thing to say about him. Um, and it really, 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 it really broke us slightly because nobody wants to hear that. Um, visuals, we brought visuals in, in and we used them when he was little and the school used them. But as time went on, we realised that they weren't working at home anymore. They just had, didn't have the same impact for when he was quite smaller than, than now. Um, at home as well, we were also noticing that he was starting to push back against things, saying no, uh, stamping, hitting, throwing, when asked to do simple things like, um, like do you want water? Or uh, where's, your, where's your shoes? You know, where'd, where'd you put your shoes, your coat? Um, he would completely flip. He would go from not to 100 and completely break down. He just couldn't take what we were saying to him at all. It was it just he just couldn't handle it. Um, unfortunately, uh, at the school, um, there wasn't a day that went by without um, something going on. Um, we were constantly we were trying to avoid them at times. Um, you know, he wasn't participating in the circle time or activities. Um, and he, he ended up having to eat on his own at a table. Um, with no other children and it absolutely broke our hearts because it was like Jesus how, how can you leave a child to eat at the table but that at that time that was the best option for him that they taught um, as things went on he started to get vocal tics um, he had echolalia and we knew that he had echolalia and he'd done it all the time but this is different we'd be sitting there and he would start making noises and we, we'd be sitting there looking for bees in the house or, or did we have rats or mice because they were the most little squeakiest noises and we didn't, we, I was kind of like, God, what's happening? And so we looked over and he was sitting sitting down and he was just making these, these noises. And I realised at that point that that was anxiety, that this was his way of letting out his, his anxiety, um, especially when he came home here because this is massively his safe space. Um, the ticks would be flying and his, like his, his idea affected everything he did. As time went on, we saw more anger at home and we decided to take him to a private OT to see could, could we help him like with, you know, his regulation and that, because that's, you know, you, you think like his emotions and maybe he's not able to explain and whatever. Um, but we started with OT and um, quickly he wasn't happy. He, he really wasn't happy. Um, the time had to be cut short on occasion um, because he just he, he just couldn't do, you know, what was being asked. Um, and now now I know that it, it wasn't um, it wasn't that he, he wouldn't do it. It was that he couldn't do it. Like, I can't do it. Um, but he just didn't have that then to verbalize that he couldn't do it. Um, we use visual schedules um, to try and, you know, tell him that he was going to um, OT or, you know, going to school or whatever. And um, when he saw the OT picture up on that visual schedule, um, I, I'd ask him, you know, do you want to go to OT today? We're going to go to IT, you know, it's going to be so much fun. And um, he, he, he would say, yeah, he would say, yeah, yeah, OT. Yeah, he knew where, we kind of thought he knew where he was going. And once we got to the car, he would go into a full-blown meltdown. 
um, we wouldn't be able to get them into the care. And it took a lot of time. A lot of, we, you know, we were trying everything. Eventually, we got them in. And at that point, I think we really understood that he didn't understand what we were saying. Plus, that this 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 picture had set something off in a, in his little his little mind. Um, I took down the visual schedules because I wasn't happy. I really wasn't happy. And I basically just def- left up his one for school. So like his shoes, his coat, just, just small ones, nothing with too many. Well, I didn't know there were demands at the time, but nothing too, too much for him. Um, in school, they decided to bring in a reward chart and, you know, it was tried and it worked for the first week. And we were like, okay, well maybe then it's just a bit of, you know, toddler behavior, you know, um, nothing to do with his autism, nothing to do with anything else, just being a basic three-year-old, you know, um, being able to, you know, just express himself. Um, and, and after one week, that did not work. He absolutely hated it. He just couldn't grasp it. And um, we decided that at that point that that was to be stopped. And now we don't use the reward charts at all whatsoever. Um we don't, I, I don't allow, allow anybody to use them. So school doesn't use them um, or anything like that. So they, they just didn't work for him. Um, at this point, we were kind of desperate, I suppose, because we didn't know 100% what exactly was going on. And I started to research and I started looking at ADHD. Um, I think that's kind of one that you, you do kind of go towards. Um, I started looking at ADHD and ODD and I did a course in it. And the course was great, it was fantastic, very understandable in that. But as it went on, I sat there and I said, this is not Noah. This this is not Noah. Like, I didn't see anything ADHD towards him or ODD for that. Um, And I just thought, okay, no, this isn't it. But there has to be something similar to like ADHD that goes ODD, like that they kind of go hand in hand. Was there something that went with autism? um that we uh, we just weren't told about or we didn't know about um and I came across PDA and I I I can't tell you I wish I could have recorded us but I couldn't believe what I was reading I read the piece three times and then I gave it to Tommy and I was like read it read it you know I was like this this is him and I was so elated I was like oh my god this is him this is it We, we we found it we have found it and um I found the PDA society and I thought it was brilliant. And I read absolutely everything on the PGA Society. I read it for day and night for weeks. Um, one of the things that we did know is about Noah was that we found when Tommy's family came over, because they live on the north side, so they're not over as often as much as you would be around my family. And um, when they came over, Noah was the life and soul of the party. He was like, he have great crack. He would, you know, sing and he'd play and he'd dance, everything. And, you know, they were saying, and other people were saying, he's grand, isn't he? He's great. Like, look at him, you know, God, he's, you know, on spectrum and he's fantastic. And I was like, okay. But what they didn't know was that that was a mask and he was a huge masker. And the more that we met them, the more they came over, the more that we met people and that as he got comfortable with them, the mask started to slowly drop. And they started to see his anxiety, his focal tics, um, him getting cross and annoyed if he was asked to do something, the demands. Um, and, you know, it was a different kind of, for them, it was like, oh, okay, didn't realise, you know. Um, Noah is a huge masker. Um, girls do mask, but boys do also mask. And Noah's a masker and actually Elliot is a masker as well. So I'm, I'm very aware of it. And he um he constantly argues. So it is that thing of arguing back and forth all the time. Um, if I said something is blue, he'll correct me and tell me something else. And you can't take it personal, you know, just times where you're like, that is blue, but he he, you know, he's not going to accept that. And you have to just let it go, pick another battle. It's you know, it's not worth it. Um his anxiety can become very bad um, when he's trying to correct you or that. So, you know, you have to be very focused on how how, how it works from. Um, it's hard to watch him with other children, um, friends and that he was very, very controlling. And if he did, you know, 
he'd be with a child and he wanted kind of, you know, he wants to play that game and that was that game and you weren't playing that. And you could see the backup of the younger children not wanting to play with him. And it was very disheartening because I was like, my God, like, how are we going to get him to not kind of argue with them and that? Um, and what happened then was, you know, he he basically controlled them. He tried to control them completely and, and it just didn't work from, it really didn't work from. Um, he also, if he didn't like you, if he didn't like you, or if he didn't like an adult, I'm sorry, but that was it. That was it. There was no coming back from this. Um, he just got these kind of torn off, soft certain people. And, you know, no matter what they did, whether it was bring toys or presents or anything at all to try and, and engage him, he wasn't having it. You were the enemy and that was it. And there was times we really didn't know why why he disliked you or why you disliked that child. Um, but we had to just try and, and walk around him. Um, we tried some sports, you know, like you do, get him out, socialising, a um, bit of exercise. Um, and he went a few times. He went a few times to rugby, he went a few times to Ghana and, uh, and uh, mini, mini ga like rugby tots and stuff. And um, as the demands became more, and he was given more and more to do, like, so, you know, pick up the ball, throw the ball, push the ball, kick the ball. Um, he started to come up with these excuses of, like, my legs don't work. Um, that ball hurts my toes. Um, that ball's not the right colour. And we knew at that point then it was like, this is not for him because he just, you know, it, this is his way of expressing to us that he, he's not happy with it. Um, he also had a teddy bear, a little small teddy bear called Baby. And uh, my God, Baby was doing terrible things in this house. I tell you, I, I couldn't tell you the amount of stuff that he was doing. Uh, he was making awful messes. Um, you know, if I, you know, and children play and stuff, and you try to get them to help tidy up and that, and I'd say, do you want to tidy it up for me? And he'd say, I'm not tidying it up. Baby did that. Baby did that, and baby has to tidy it up. And I was like, okay. And I was like, you know, I'll get baby to help tidy up and that. But what he was doing was the fair and the demand. Um, whereas, you know, I just, I just didn't want to tidy up at the time. Um, one thing also that started was his imagination. And he has... Oh my God, he has the best imagination ever. Like, it's unbelievable. Fantasy. It, this is his thing, like, it's fantasy. And it started with Star Wars. Um, unfortunately, I married to a very big Star Wars buff, so he was a little bit brainwashed with Star Wars. So he started off with Darth Vader. Um, he was Darth Vader. Um, and then he might be Yoda. And he would tell us who we were. So I would be, like, a Jedi or... Um, I can't do my, he, if he heard me now, he'd kill me not being able to name them, but I, I would be somebody. And he would be a different character all the time. Um, what we found was, was that when he was talking to us or he wanted something, he would be like, Darth Vader says he wants toast. And we were like, okay. So we answered him back. We're like, Darth Vader, we will put that toast on. And this pretending and helping him and answering him back this way actually helped him to cope. We really found it helped him to cope. And it made it easier for us to be able to get around and to talk to him. So, you know, if there was something that you wanted to say, like maybe, you know, we're going here, we're going there. I'd be like, you know, Yoda is getting ready to put her coat on and he's going out that door to the car. And that really, really helped. And we, could, we couldn't believe that. That was amazing. Um, he's very comfortable in fantasy play or story mode, as I call it. He goes into story mode and he still he still does it now. Um, and we still use it now. When he goes to school in the morning, he may walk up and he may be a character and your character walking him up. When he gets to the school gate, okay, he once he sees his SNA, he'll be like, hello, SNA, you are, hello, Catherine, you are Luigi today. And she'll interact back with him. And that that's great because it just gives him that, um, you know, it helps him with the anxiety and that. Um, one of the things that we kind of looked at as well was he was, when, when they're little and they're autistic and they're little, they get fixated on things like maybe cars or dinosaurs, whatever, or, or unicorns, whatever, whatever the child likes. And unfortunately, as Noah got bigger, and I say it's unfortunate because it came a little bit of a danger, um, he became obsessed with babies. Babies in chair, uh, prams, babies in car seats, anything, babies. Um, he would even, 
run across the road to the point of running across the road to get to a baby. Um, we were in the zoo one time and there was a baby in a, in a pram and we were a little bit far from that bit and he bolted. He saw that baby, we didn't see it. And he bolted and I nearly died. I was like, oh my God. Um, and I just said to the parents, you know, I'm very sorry, like he, he likes babies. And I just, you know, I always kind of say, you know, he's on spectrum and he may have, you know, PDA by looking at it. And the look on people's faces, it just broke us. It was like, you know, how, how would you explain to these people when they're looking at you and they're saying to you, he's just a brat, like that's a brat. Like he just ran off and doing his own thing. It was so hard. Um, and it took a very long time to kind of help with that obsession. He does still like babies, but now he has an understanding that he can't run off to see them, that I will bring him over or, you know, whatever. And it helped as well that he did have a little brother um, eventually as well. So um, at the time we were seeing, at this time then we were seen by the HSC and we had a floor time, 30 minutes a session once a week. And what we were getting was, you know, he's great, he's fantastic, he's doing this and he's doing that, which is absolutely fantastic to hear. But in the back of my head, I was kind of like, okay, why aren't they saying anything? You know, why, why what, what's going on here? Like, um, and soon enough, as soon as he got comfy with the children, um, the mask slipped. Um, and and that was kind of the start of it. He was officially diagnosed um autistic by the HSC at that point so psychology appointments came with that um and when I started with psychology appointments I started to push towards PDA um and I won't lie she looked at me like I had absolutely two heads she um she just kept you know she kind of just shocked and she said ODD and I said no PDA and I, I, I said the name pathological demand avoidance um I told her that the scripted strategies did not work um, and I was told, uh, basically, get used to them, get used to them, use them more. He will get used to it. And at that point, I'd had enough. We had had enough as, as a family, um, not getting any help and using strategies that were putting my child into really, really bad anxiety and really bad demands. Um, so we decided on ourselves that we're, we're going to research and we're going to start putting strategies and we're going to help them because nobody else was able to help them. At every meeting, I brought up the PDA. I started to bring PDA leaflets uh, to her, to show her. Um, you know, and she's just, she's just look at me. Uh, while at home, we started implementing strategies um, to help. And we removed visual schedules, put up single visual info. So on my door, I just have a stop sign. Um, I used concrete materials. So like we'd say to him, like, wipe the feet when you come in. Like, and he, he had a picture that I took that away, put a mat down, washing your hands. I just put a picture of a sign. They are visuals, but they're not a demand. Like they're not too demanding for him. Um, and they're there. For a reminder, I don't go to him. There, there's that, there's that thing there. I he if he needs to, he'll glance up and he knows what to do. Um, and with us removing all these, he started to relax a bit. Um, and instead of enforcing the schedules on with timers and that, we 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 I took timers away and we changed how um we spoke to him. We used this fantasy and we used humor, his great sense of humor. Um, and we used humor, and uh, sometimes it worked, sometimes it doesn't. And what worked today, what worked tomorrow, what works this week didn't work next week. But we always went back to two of us in the evening um, with a cup of tea. And we'd sit and we'd say, God, did we put a demand in there by an accident? You know, did, did I say something? You know, because we were getting used to it and that. Um, and we still do that now. Um, he doesn't like to force routines, but he has to stick to a routine, um, which, which we say is a compromise routine. So where he has control on what happens to a certain extent. Um, we brought in choice boards to give him a little bit more control as well. And Noah had a cognitive assessment done. And part of this was the home visit by the psychologist at the time. Um, and I was delighted with this because, because of the way that she had just dismissed PGA, I knew that she was going to see a different version of Noah at home in his safe space, um, where he could drop his mask, you know, where he could be himself and not have to worry about a demand or um, his anxiety. And she saw a different side to him then. She saw that she, she couldn't get him to do anything and that he was very impulsive and that. And she saw all this, but she wasn't seeing it when we were up, up, in, the, up in the services. Um, as she was leaving, she, you know, I, I kind of, she and I be down, which I think the first time that I was like, as she's going out the door, getting in her car. So now don't forget to look at the PDA Society, you know, you know, look at that page and maybe you might see a few things. And she, she 
just smiled at me. Um, I brought PDA books up to her. I asked, would she like to read them? Um, and I started to notice that she was starting to agree. She was starting to agree. And after his assessment for his cognitive, uh, we, you know, do we have a chat? I, I said to her, like, well, what, what, what do you think, I, you know, PDA-wise? We know he's autistic. What about PDA-wise? And she, she said, I have to do some digging. And I just thought, this is going on nearly, we're coming up to a year, you know, what more digging do you really, really need to do? Um, you know, at the end of the day, then what happened was his report came out and when I opened it, there it was in black and white. Um, we were absolutely thrilled. No, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, that's the, that's the boss man. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically, um, I couldn't believe we were thrilled. There was no was diagnosed with PDA, and we were absolutely thrilled. Um, you know, this is like this, this is this is what we needed. You know, um, I will say, look, you know, PDA is the hardest part of um, of his autism. Nothing prepared us for what um, for what was going to happen. I'm so sorry. Outside, go quickly. No, 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 no. It's <laughs> easy to raise demand on me now. <laughs> um, and you know, it, it, it's a very, it's a very, very hard part of us asking, not prepared us for it. But this opened the door slightly. But as you know, there is nothing in Ireland for PDA. Like I, I know what Neil is saying there, and there is a great group called Prism and that. But health-wise and services does nothing. Um, health professionals and schools don't recognise it. You're trying to help your child with this unknown part of autism and you're fighting a society that won't and refuses to recognise PDA. Health professionals also couldn't help us with toileting. Um, a sachets of Mova call a day um, to try and get them to go. And in the end, you know what worked for us was consistency, waiting on him to be ready and making it fun with his interests. You know, making him do it when he wanted to do it with, with, with with what he loved to do um, and fantasy mode. I was a lot of Darth Vader that day as well. Um, over the years, we've learned PDA is tough on both the child and the parents, but it's becoming better, it's becoming recognised and, you know, um, it's still not enough, but it's getting there. Um, everywhere we go, we explain about PDA, we, we, we raise it, you know, we talk about it. Um, and I have I have signs up in the house to say, you know, for family members and friends to come in that this is their, this is his space, safe space and to respect it and to understand how, how he feels. Um, for every year of school, I do a PDA pack. So from junior infants, I started a PDA pack and a passport. And then this I explain everything comes from the, the PDA society. So the SNAs and the teachers understand them. And I've been very, very blessed with the teachers and the SNAs that he's had over the last three years. They've been really, really understanding, willing to learn about PDA. And because of this and because of his SNA, um, he's able to go to school. And he may have good days and he may have bad days, but they're able to help him out, you know, and, and that's what's needed. Um, if I go to a GP, I wear a lanyard. Um, and if we have a hospital appointment, I bring PDA society stuff with me. So I'm telling them. Um, we're still learning. Same as autism, we're still learning. We'll always be learning. We're now as the funniest cheeky charmer. Everyone who meets him loves him. And uh, he will go far with the right supports behind him. And we'll continue to make sure he gets them supports and that he feels safe and secure in what he does in the future and um, forever. Um, <laughs> uh, and I just last thing to say thank you. Thank you uh, for having me. Sorry for the disturbance, but I'm a mom at the end of the day. <laughs> and uh, don't forget that this Saturday is... Um, PDA day. So um, celebrate your PDAers, uh, you know, shout it from the rooftop. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. I've gone over time, but thank you. <laughs> oh, you're absolutely grand. Thank you so much, Margaret, for joining us and for sharing your story uh, with everyone here today. A big thank you to Noah as well for his little cameo there. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> uh, also, we really appreciate, um, um, sorry, Neil uh, joining us tonight as well. Um, Thank you very much. So uh, there is some questions there as well that we might move on to some of the questions. Um, if you